Welcome everybody to our program today with Hope For Our Times. Listen, I have a really special guest today, first time ever, and uh, we're gonna work right on through some incredible things. You guys are gonna be really blessed. But after experiencing a radical spiritual encounter at the age of 17, Alan Didia was born again, instantly transforming him from a dogmatic atheist into a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Alan is the host of Encounter Today on YouTube, the Encounter Underground podcast, and the founder of Encounter Christ Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, in more than two decades of ministry. He's traveled internationally, working with the persecuted church around the world, and directed an international prayer center where he prayed one-on-one with more than 100,000 people. This unique experience comes out in his writings and ministry as he seeks to ignite the fire of God in the hearts of humanity and equip end time believers for the next great awakening. And in 2022, Alan was ordained as Bishop and Overseer of City Harvest Network. I know it's not a title he thoroughly enjoys having. We both aren't (laughs) thrilled about titles, but it is what we have. So Alan, this is such a, this is incredible for us to have you here. Very excited it's such, about this. Such an honor to be here. By the way, if, if all preachers' bios were true, we would have won the world to Jesus, you know, three decades ago. <laughs> That's but great. Thank you for that. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> that is fantastic. So, Al, again, just really uh, a real blessing. But we're going to, for me to have you here, but we're going to start right at the top with, uh, we're going to work through things. Elon Musk's warning about the dangers of artificial intelligence. Uh, We're going to talk about the importance of renewing the mind, prioritizing in-person discipleship, and practicing digital Sabbath or Shabbat. I want to hear what that is because that really has me intrigued. And if it is what I think it is, man, is something that that I think we desperately need uh, in the believer's life. Uh, We're also going to work at, I I want to ask you about this. I, I love this. The Church of Philadelphia serves as a model for surviving the shaking by being true to the Word of God and staying faithful to Jesus. Then you also have a book out called Summoning the Demon. So we have we have a lot of territory we're going to cover here. So yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a fun conversation. Might get a little controversial, but hang in there with us because we're going to bring it back to the Word. That that, I don't mind being controversial. In fact, I kind of enjoy it because listen, I think our minds need to be challenged. And, and expanded in truth, though. But we got to examine yes. what, what, what is going on out there because there are some wild things that are going on out there. All right, so let's just start right at the top, and we're going to work through these things and more if we have time. Um, so Elon Musk's his warning about the dangers of artificial intelligence and the need for regulation. What's your perspective on that as we look at this? And we've heard it, but I'd really like to get into your brain and, and figure this out. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I titled the book Summoning the Demon, because when Elon was asked about artificial intelligence, he said, with AI, we are summoning the demon. And then he talked about how in a movie, when a guy draws a pentagram on the ground and he's going to summon a demon and think he can control it. And he said, it's it's not going to work out really well for that guy because that demon's going to turn on him. With artificial intelligence, that's exactly what's happening. Another another prominent a researcher in AI has said it's as if at a date certain an alien intelligence was going to land on this planet. Imagine for a moment that they are a thousand times smarter than us and better than us at everything, and that's the only thing we know about them. How would we prepare for that moment when we meet them? That's what's that's what's developing with AI. That another researcher, if I can say this, said that with AI we will cure cancer. It's just on the other end of that, we could potentially destroy civilization. So there are great risks, which is why I wrote this, but I don't want the church to go to extremes the same way they did when the radio came out and they said, oh, we can't have anything to do with that, that's the devil. When television came out, they had that antenna and the and the cable and they said, that's the horns and that's the tail. We can't have anything to do with that. We need to utilize it as long as we possibly can, be as influential as we can in its development, but we need to be very, very, very discerning about what's happening right now because I think it's preparing the way for the Antichrist agenda. Yeah, so as we look at the summoning the demons, are are you saying that technology itself can be possessed or we are just opening up ourselves? Like, uh, take CERN, for example. Uh, Mm. you, You look at that. Are we opening up a porthole to the demonic world? 
And is that what, what you're seeing AI is doing, opening up a porthole, or is technology itself, can it be even possessed? You know, it's interesting that you asked that question. I think it could be both and. I think oh. that technology can be used to dull the senses and to weaken the will. Uh, Yuval Noah Harari, uh, the false prophet of the World Economic Forum, recently came out and said that we've got too many people. What are we going to do with all these useless people? With the advancement of AI, we're going to have all these useless people. And they said, well, what do we do? He said, we dumb them down with drugs and we addict them to video games. And so he used video games as a way of that technology of dumbing down the populace so that they'd be more pliable, more easily manipulated. So I think both are true. I think in the same way that uh, we saw this boy in the New Testament where he's thrown in the fire and he's thrown in the water by a demonic spirit. If, if a demonic spirit can throw a child in the fire, can it throw a switch? Can it manipulate uh, technology? That's an interesting theological question. I don't know that I have the answer. But we do know that if we allow these things to happen, Neuralink uh, recently has successfully implanted a chip inside someone's brain, so they're controlling a mouse um, with their mind. Um, Apple iPods are now using the same technology to read thoughts. They're putting that in their iPods in the future to be able to take that data of what you're thinking and try to harness that information. Are they going to be able to dull our will? Are they going to be able to manipulate us? And will that open the door for demonic influence in individuals' lives? I think the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, I, I do too. In fact, if we, I, I think Christians are mistaken when they don't think that demonic activity is only going to increase. When we look at Jesus when he came the first time, his presence exposed mm. demons, right? You don't read yes. a lot about, you read, I guess you read about the demonic influences in the world in the Old Testament. We can understand the pagan cultures, that Israel was dealing with ancient Israel. We can understand you have this demonic influence over Persia, for example. You read the book of Daniel. You have these things. But Jesus shows up on the scene, and demons are exposed everywhere. Every, mm -hmm. You see the different places he's going. He's casting out demons. He gave the power to the apostles to go and cast out demons too. Um, and then he leaves the scene. He, he, he dies. He's resurrected. He ascends to heaven. We have the beginning of the church age. And you don't hear a lot about the demonic activity unless you go into uh, other countries, parts of Africa, South America. You know, you've done some missionary work and you hear yes. about these things from missionaries. Here in the Western world, you don't hear much about it. However, I do think we've been um, seriously spiritually compromised just by mm. the pleasures of this world. All the advances that we have in America, for example, have caused us to move ourselves from God and seem to think everything is okay. But when I look at the demonic influences happening here in America, we see what's happening in TV. We see what's happening in movies. We see, I mean, we have the, I mean, you start looking at, at things with the child trafficking. There's no doubt there's demonic things that are happening. Some of the things coming out of Congress uh, Easter or Resurrection Sunday, I prefer to call it. Uh, what, what does yes. the White House do? What does Virginia do? What, what's happening across the board? The governor of New York, all these different things. Man, I'm, I'm supposed to be asking you questions. I'm just doing all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> me, I'm yeah, you're going exactly, somewhere you're, with this. <laughs> you're exactly right. I was just down in Texas where we were working with an organization to rescue children out of, out of human traffic, trafficking. So we went across the border into Mexico where there was a school of children that we had helped get out of human trafficking and the stories of all of those children, every single one of them had the most horrific stories that you could possibly imagine. And they were all connected to this, some sort of satanic ritualistic worship uh, that's, that's booming. And so we overseas, and I've been overseas in third world nations, and you're right, it is open and apparent because Satan thinks he can get away with it. I think here in America, it's been so stigmatized that number one, people don't talk about the activity of demonic oppression in their personal lives and the enemy is scared because we have so many believers per capita more so than and in other nations of the world uh, that he will confront one of these people who has that greater one living on the inside of them and so you're exactly right it's it seems to be more and more on open display that we're seeing it on the on the streets and on the news demon possession and oppression uh, I, I what i've seen is even atheists and agnostics have this sense that something evil is happening. 
where they've never talked like this. They never used language like this. Like for the first time, they believe evil is real. The eclipse that we have coming up right now, why is it such a big deal? It's not the first eclipse that we've ever had like this, but everyone senses that something is up. Mm -hmm. Just something deep within them. They know that something is looming and they wonder, is this going to be mm -hmm. the trigger? Is this going to be it? A recent statistic I saw was 42% of Americans believe Jesus could return in their lifetime. 42%. 42%. percent. And how many of them actually even go to church? That's or, the key. So 24% yeah. claim to be born again, less than that go to church. That means there's a large percentage of the population who believe Jesus could come in their lifetime and they know they're not ready, yeah. which is why I'm so thankful for this ministry and for everyone who partners with you, because this is the apologetic of the day. This is how we win the loss, by declaring that Jesus is soon to come. Amen. You know, I look at uh, the eclipse. Now, for me, I don't put a lot of, uh, I just don't spend a lot of time looking at those types of things. I'm well mm -hmm. aware of them. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I'm very well aware. I'm aware of all the different videos that people send me. I've seen a lot. I've read a lot. Um, the eclipse, I believe, is going to come and go. Yeah. Um, I, will bad things happen on uh, today, April 8th? that this is posting. Will bad things happen today? Listen, bad things happen every day. And we are continuing to see bad things happen. Um, what I'm concerned about is the people who aren't paying attention. And obviously, mm. you've already said 40, 42% of people yes. are looking going, hey, something is Jesus coming back. What you're saying just totally fits with uh, Daniel chapter 12, where the angel tells Daniel, Hey, in that day, the wicked will see it, but they won't understand, but the wise will understand. And the implication is that everybody's going to know something is amiss. Something mm -hmm. is not right. I mean, I look at Bill Maher, you know, this atheist, this night, he's even saying, hey, something ain't right. And you start looking at these, these guys who, as you mentioned, these atheists, they're, they're saying these things, well-known ones, going, something is wrong in Denmark. And then you look and go, um, w when Jesus came the first time again, demons are exposed. They're coming out everywhere. Uh, they're casting them out. Jesus is and his apostles. The, of course, with his second coming, he is coming back. We, mm -hmm. And we know from reading the book of Revelation, you have an explosion of demonic activity. But the only way that could happen is if this is already being invited into the world. Yes. And that's what I think you're getting at. Yeah, absolutely. Revelation 12, 12 says Satan will come down in the last days knowing his time is short. How sad is it that Satan knows his time is short and he's increasing his activity, yet the church has no idea what time it is and they're decreasing their activity, which is why I'm so thankful for your book, Marking the Masses. And I think it's really important for people to know that long before the Antichrist marks people's heads, he's going to mark their minds oh. in order to pave the way. Yeah. He has to manipulate the masses and mark their minds first. And that's what we're seeing happen. That is totally what people are not paying, not understanding. That's really what my book was about, is the, uh, the people are being um, uh, uh, manipulated isn't the right word. They're being um, uh, prepared. Uh, yes. the, their hearts and minds are being prepared. That's why we have wokeism. That's why we, we have transgenderism in schools with children. All of this is a preparation, the gaslighting that's going on. All of this is a preparation of the minds of people to be, it's a Hegelian dialectic. It, we are being moved along without even realize that, realizing we are being moved along. But people aren't going to receive the technology unless their hearts are prepared. Uh, the technology that marks them, that causes them to be willing to receive a digital currency, for example, uh, and on down the list. Um, you have... Uh, this yes. the potential manipulation and control of humans by advanced AI leading to societal and ethical implications. You already touched on that a little bit. Uh, do you want to get into that a little bit more? Yeah, I think one of the most interesting ethical implications that we're dealing with, because everyone's talking about really what they're talking about when they talk about AI, is the technological singularity, which is what everyone is concerned about. Singularity is a scientific term that refers to a black hole, that when we reach the edge of a black hole, we, when you enter into it, all known laws of physics break down, so there's no way to predict what's going to happen next. And they've coined this term technological singularity, which is a reference that means when we reach that technology where artificial intelligence can replicate itself and, and is smarter than us in every possible way, 
there's no way to predict what's going to happen to civilization. We already know that 40% of the economy in the next three years is going to be upended. In the next decade, 80% of the economy will be upended through artificial intelligence. So just on that level, we're going to see tremendous upheaval all over the world. But now when we get into the moral implications, when does it become conscious? That's that's a question that everyone is asking. And what I posit in the book is that it'll never become conscious, obviously, because consciousness comes from God and the world has no idea how to define consciousness. So what they're going to do is they're going to redefine consciousness to include artificial intelligence. Because over the next couple of years, it's already happening right now, men and women are going to fall in love with these chatbots and with these automatons. And in order to be inclusive and tolerant, we're going to have to include, redefine consciousness to include these robots, to include these language models in, within that definition. And that's going to be far more damaging because we're diluting what it means to be human, what it means to be uh, created in the image of God. And that's going to be one of the most difficult uh, moral uh quandaries that we face in the coming days. Uh, we have the same temptation coming from the things that Yuval Noah Harari and the others out of Silicon Valley, World Economic Forum, and on down the list. They're telling us with Eve when she was in the garden, the serpent tempts her and says, did God really say that? He knows mm -hmm. in the day that you eat of this fruit that's in the midst of the garden, you won't surely die, but you will be like God. These are the same two promises that these people are telling us. Uh, we, we're hearing with uh, some of the technology, uh, well, you already mentioned uh, about uh, curing cancer, for example. The lame will walk, the deaf will hear, the blind will see. Well, wait a minute. This is Jesus. And when we look at the, uh, the uh, false prophet and antichrist, when they're on the scene, they perform line wonders. So they're not going to be real miracles like Jesus did, but they will be lying and they'll be so deceiving that people will think, hey, this is the Messiah, we will never, they're going to buy into the lie. And the deception, I don't think people understand how great the deception is going to be. Uh, what we've seen so far is only the beginning. You know, we don't know when we're going to be raptured. Listen, I hope we're raptured before this program's done, right? However, we don't know. So the deception is yes. only going to increase, and all these things you're saying is really leading that direction. Yeah, it's no question. And, and, I think it was 48% of AI researchers were surveyed. And they said of, of all of 3,000 AI researchers, excuse me, that were surveyed, 48% said that they believe there's a 10% chance AI could end civilization. So imagine for a moment getting on an airplane and 48% of the people who worked on that airplane say there's a 10% chance you're not going to make it to your destination. That's where we are right now. That's, that's how precarious this moment is. But this is not a time to hang our head. This is not, not a time to be fearful or concerned about the dangers that we're facing. These are supernatural threats that we're facing. And I think the body of Christ is, is a lot like the children of Israel when they were faced with Goliath. For many of them, mm. when they're seeing this giant taunting them, they're cowering in fear. Many of them, it was their first revelation of a Nephilim-like opposition, a supernatural giant opposition. But there was somebody mm. in the camp whose name was David something rose within him and said, I was born for the kingdom for such a time as this, that there's greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. So I want to encourage everybody, these are dark days, no doubt, but the glory of God is going to rise upon his people. And we have a blessed hope to keep us encouraged and strengthened through these difficult days. Man, that was great. So I, I was just in Israel and I took a, a small group uh, up to the area of, of, uh, um, Gosh, I can't remember what the mountaintop is called. You're, it's, it's the two-gate city, and you're looking down into the Elah Valley. And so mm -hmm. you have the map of the Israelites coming across. You have, you have the Philistines on this mountain. You have them on that mountain. Uh, the people of Israel, the, the people of Israel coming across. And this is the picture you got. Everything you just laid out. Everybody's afraid. There's giants in the land. And here comes this young guy who's filled with the Spirit of God. By the way, we do need to be filled with the Spirit of God. I don't care what anybody says. We need to be filled with that Holy Spirit power to be able to rise up to the occasion. And I look at the church, and you know, there's a lot of people that will watch this, but there's still a lot of fear. We are never told to be afraid. And right. we are given the prophecy, so we'll be prepared, 
So we'll understand these things are coming. We need to be encouraged. And I love how you said that. We, we really need, need to be like David's and recognize God is with us. Who can yes. be against us? All the things that we were taught when we were kids in school, all the things that we were, excuse me, when we were in church, you know, who knows what school's different, <laughs> <laughs> but oh, the things we were taught in Bible studies, even as an adult, yes, I believe this. Yes, I believe that. Well, the last four years launched us into a whole different world where we, our faith gets to be tested. And this is a great challenge for us to rise up to the occasion of everything we always said that we believed and to be like mm. a David, to be like a, a, a Joshua, to be like a Caleb, and to take that next hill and not, yes. to, not to cower because God told us, hey, this is what it's going to look like. We live in amazing days. And like you said, this is not the time to not move forward. This is the time to press forward with everything we have. Yeah, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, a very familiar passage of Scripture says, greater is he that is in us Amen. than he that is in the world. And sometimes I think we've quoted that so often and seen it on so many bumper stickers that our religious repetition has relieved our prayers of any real power or meaning uh. in the sense that we're not thinking about what that means. When you look at that verse in context, verse 3 is talking about the Antichrist spirit. Greater is he that is in us than the Antichrist spirit that is in the world. That is the direct reference that it's talking about. We have the greater one living on the inside of us, giving us revelation. And it's, and it's fascinating that that uh, AI promises all these things, as you say, that, that a false Messiah would promise. But we have the true Messiah. So whatever, whatever power or promise AI has, or the Antichrist has, or the false prophet has, we have the real answer. We have the real power. So let them throw down their staffs and let them turn into serpents. We have a God who calls what we throw down to turn into a snake that'll consume the collective works of the enemy. I think this will be the church's finest hour as we see a great influx of souls in these last days. Man, I love that. I'm going to ask you more about that in just a second. This is exciting, man. I'm all pumped up. I can't wait. <laughs> this whole program, I'm going to be really fired up. Hey, Alan, how do people connect with you? Well, EncounterToday.com is the best way to get all of our stuff, connect with all of our media, but we've got uh, SummoningTheDemon.com or BlameItOnTheNephilim.com takes you to the same place. <laughs> Blame it on that. That's great. <laughs> I just like that URL because no matter what's going on in the world, you can always blame, blame it on the Nephilim <laughs> I'd love to ask you about that sometime. That's great. Blame it on the Nephilim. I hear a lot of blame on the Nephilim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, 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 you probably aren't old enough to remember Flip Wilson, but I, I am. Oh, so, uh, yeah. You, Blame it on the devil. Yeah. Okay, but the devil made me the do it. The devil made me do it. And that, was, that was quite popular some 50 years ago. But still, I, I, you don't strike me as being that old. <laughs> or you just look old, really old young. soul. Old soul. You <laughs> okay. know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Marx Brothers kind of guy anyway. Oh, so. that's great. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, but the, the greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, First uh, John chapter 4. So we look at that. And I, just to encourage believers to stand up and recognize, I, I think of uh, Revelation chapter 12, which you already quoted, when the devil knows he has little time. It appears he already knows he has little time. But when we hit the midpoint of the tribulation, man, this thing's going to be stepped up, which I yes. do believe we're going to be raptured before then. Yes. Nevertheless, they overcome him. This is the believers during the tribulation period. How? By the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, they do not love their life unto death. What can the devil do to us? Man, we fight forward, we go forward. You already talked about human trafficking. You gotta go and stand up for righteousness. And too many people just, I just don't wanna get involved in it. Uh, you also mentioned this, how scripture has become so repetitive. How many people go to Bible studies all the time and are willing to look at the scripture, say, oh, that's exciting, yes, live by faith, but they, they just don't do it. You know, just, yeah, it's we like, feel like if we've talked about it, we did it, oh, right? Great. If we yeah. hear a sermon on prayer, we feel like we prayed. If yeah. we hear a sermon on missions, we feel like we've done missions and we can live our lives vicariously through our pastors or our, our favorite online ministers. Uh, but I think people are sensing that those days are over. And that's that's what the Blessed Hope does. You know, for too many believers either have their head in the sand or their head in the clouds and they're just seem to be useless. Um, to the body of Christ and to the kingdom. But a real blessed hope, a real understanding of the rapture gives you this hustle theology where you have this two-minute warning ringing in your spirit when you wake up in the morning and you realize that any moment I'm going to meet the king and I want to make sure I have something to lay at his feet. I want to make sure that when he finds me, 
he finds me doing what he's called me to do. That's where we are right now. It's an exciting time. We're not fearful of meeting our king. We're thrilled to meet him, and we just want to honor him. We love him so much. Pastor Hughes, I want to. I want this generation to fall in love with the return of Jesus because the Apostle Paul said that there's a crown for all those who love his appearing. So many people have been browbeaten with it, you know, that they're just fearful of it. You ought to be excited about it, that we get to meet the one whom we love. And when we do, oh, we just want to be able to bless him. We want to bless him. Amen. Hey, if you call me Pastor Hughes, I'm going to call you Bishop Didio. How's that? (laughs) (laughs) You can be... (laughs) <laughs> Deal. All right. So Bishop Didio. Anyways. <laughs> so, it's just habit. No, I, I, I totally get it. I, I, I totally get it. So uh, when it comes to the rapture, um, I, I mean, there's so much uh, pushback towards anybody who teaches a pre-tribulation rapture or rapture of any sort right now, whether it be pre-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, whatever it is, but especially against those who preach pre-trib rapture. Now, two things I want to ask you about. I just want, I want to comment on one and then ask you about the rapture. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, just confirming everything that you just said, Peter writes and he says, therefore, since all these things will be, as Peter walks us right on through from creation to the second coming of Christ, the mocking that's coming our way, a new heaven, a new earth, he then says, since all these things will be, therefore, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct mm. and godliness, looking for and hastening the day of the coming of God. So hence, that's exactly what you're saying. It's like, hey, we're going to be called up. Let's go and do everything that we can to live for the kingdom of God now. As a runner yes. who runs the race, man, you we see the finish line. And all of us who are into prophecy, we all say we see the finish line. Well, then we ought to be running as hard as we can. So I, yes. I really appreciate that. But the rapture, was, I mean, your thoughts, there's so much angst against anybody who preaches a preacher rapture especially. Um, where do you think that's coming from? Yeah, methinkest thou protesteth too much, as the old saying goes. It's fascinating. Of all the different eschatological views, there's only one that is hated to such an extreme extent. And I think we need to ask ourselves the question, why? Why? And I know pastors who will avoid the subject because of how heated it gets. And recently we were doing a teaching on the subject because we, we like you, don't mind wading into the controversy. And someone asked me, our post trip are referring to post trippers, but we know everyone's not like this. Not all, not all, not all, but some. They said, are they all that mean and hateful? Because just the comments were so mean and aggressive. And it's interesting that when, when it's attacked that much, I truly believe this. We need to pay attention to the doctrines that are attacked, that are abused, and that are ridiculed. And instead of running from them, which tends to be the modus operandi of the church, we need to say, okay, if the enemy is attacking that, that means that's what we need to be focused on. We need to build that up. We need to strengthen it. And I think right now is the time more than ever. I can't tell you how many times I've been told, listen, Pastor Allen, you talk about the end times, but just don't talk about your belief as far as the rapture and the timing of it. You're going to lose a lot of potential interviews. You're going to lose speaking engagements. And I, I can't do it. I can't do it. This is, when I was first born again, this is what began to ring in my spirit. Jesus is coming, that we are, we are the generation, that the coming of the Lord is imminent. And we need to be looking for it. And I think it's key of all New Testament eschatology. It can all be summed up in one word, watch. That we're called as believers to watch for him. And that causes us to live holy. That causes us to attend church because we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. That calls us to be watchful as as a servant who's going to meet his master so that we're faithful in what he's called us to do. If we remove that one thing from the church, then we're removing so much more than we can possibly imagine. So I think... It is so vehemently attacked because this is the area we need to drill down on and support ministries like yours who are doing it so well. Yeah, I think it's just one more confirmation for the the truth. I mean, we look at the nation of Israel. Why is there suddenly this unbelievable increase in anti-Semitism, hatred of Israel? Well, Satan knows the only way he's going to have victory over Jesus is to eliminate Israel, eliminate the Jew. It ain't going to happen. But why is there so much hatred towards Israel, hatred towards the teaching on the preacher of rapture? Because Satan knows it's true. I, it, it goes with the atheist. If the atheists say, well, God isn't real, well, why don't they go after Santa Claus the same way they come after right. the person who believes in God, right? <laughs> yeah. But they don't because Satan knows these things are all true. So I, I totally see that and have thought about it the same way. If something is so attacked with your doctrine, then... Obviously, 
there's something going on there because it, it, it's such a, a strange uh, uh, amount of attention that's given to it. Hey, by the way, everybody, I just want to encourage you on Alan's book, Summoning the Demons, and just uh, listen, uh, check it out. I, I would encourage you to get a copy of the book. Uh, you can get it through Alan's ministry at Encounter Today. And then also, um, we'll even have them here in the uh, Hope for Our Times store too. You can check that out. But you're going to be super blessed, as you can already tell. For those of you who haven't been introduced to Alan yet, I know many of you already have. Uh, but those of you who haven't, you're already getting, you're, you're finding out why uh, he's such a valuable voice uh, to the world right now and to the church also. And thank you guys for joining us. Okay, we have a lot more to go. So, Alan, let me ask you this. Um, digital Sabbath or digital mm. Shabbat, the importance of renewing the mind, prioritizing in-person discipleship, and practicing digital, di, digital, digital Sabbath <laughs> to, in, to <laughs> counter the negative effects of technology. Explain yeah. what that is. So as I've as I already said, I'm not for abandoning technology. We need to dominate it as much as we possibly can. But that doesn't mean we we should not be leery because this is made to be addictive. The algorithms on social media are made like like um um what are those gambling places? Casinos. Casinos are made to keep you in there, you know, and, and to keep you locked in. Social media is made to keep you addicted, and many of you are, and you don't even realize it. And so one of the ways that we can try to dominate tech without being dominated by it is to practice digital Sabbaths. You need to take time to put your phone down, to turn off your devices, and to step away. And you need to do it with regularity. There's one thing to fast. It's another thing to live a fasted lifestyle so that you're constantly exercising your wills, dominion, and authority to make decisions, to break away from things. And I think with social media, we need to utilize it. We need to use it. When you're watching a program like this, you need to share it, like, comment, and recognize that you're juicing the algorithm when you do that to get it in front of more people. And then when you're done, step away. Set it down and get in front of your family. Go outside. Practice digital Sabbath. And what I mean by that is just stepping away from your device for an extended period of time for half a day, for a day, regularly throughout the week. And then in addition to that, as people gravitate toward tech, I think it's really important to prioritize in-person discipleship. That's going to become more and more valuable, and this generation is going to be blown away by it because they're so used to being detached and disconnected. When they actually connect with someone who loves them and cares for them, it's going to be an amazing witness for Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to ask you about Israel in a, in a couple of minutes, but but I want to ask you go a little bit further down this path first. Um, I, I think it's it, it, just an outstanding necessity uh, the comment that you made regarding digital Sabbath. We need to do it. Uh, it's just so consuming. As we go forward, <clears throat> when I look at things, if we're not raptured, let's say within three years, this train's going to keep going down the track. And Satan's going to push the agenda. He has his minions that he works through on this planet. Technology is only going to become more and more demanding and more and more encompassing and invading on our lives. But also, uh, as we look at the need, uh, it was Chuck Smith, founder of Calvary Chapels, who said this. He said, as, I believe that as the church began in homes, it's going to end in homes. Mm. And I see it going that way if we are not raptured in the near future. And because it's just increasing the, the, the hatred towards Christianity um, and the need to, and this causes the need to ha develop good relationships apart from technology. Know who your neighbors are, know who you can yes. trust, um, tell other people about Jesus, um, have Bibles available. I believe you, we really need to have the written word available. Because um, Bible apps can be shut down at any time. And, and, and it, altered. It, and, oh, it, well, we look at AI. What's, mm -hmm. I, this is what I think is going to happen with AI. And the Bible has probably already happened. I just don't even not even aware of it yet. But as the AI Bible comes about, we're going to have AI historical documents that are going to say, well, the church fathers thought this, but they were wrong here. And mm -hmm. these scribes, they messed up here. And now we have proof that they messed up. And so here's the real truth, and they're going to bring out this Bible that is totally manipulated, 
and has enough truth in it to engage people, but it's going to be full of the wrong lies, like Jesus wasn't really the Messiah, he never really claimed that, that type of thing. But I see things going that way, and we need to have the written word now. I'm so glad you brought that up because I've been I've been harping on this for the last two or three years. I think one of the biggest battles of the next decade will be the inspiration of the Word of God. And uh, Manly P. Hall, who was a famed occultist in the early to mid 20th century, he had ties to the White House. He said, we have been trying to get out a translation of the Bible that is reasonably correct but all these people want is their good old King James Bible, every jot and tittle. And they have, we were having trouble getting a revised version of the Bible out to be successful. And it makes me wonder, what was that version that they were trying to get out? Did it ever get out? And are they still trying to um, plant diluted versions of the Word? So I think it's really important that believers prioritize Scripture. We as preachers, I think um, we need to get back to the Word of God and verse-by-verse verse teaching, not in every single service. I'm not saying it has to be done everywhere all the time, but I think it's really, really important, and we need to get believers back to Genesis to Revelation and make sure. That's the reason why with this book, I go into all these crazy, you know, fringe uh, theories, but my reason for it is to say, okay, but what does the Word say? I was so concerned that believers are going down these rabbit holes of conspiracy theories. They were going so far, they were detaching from the Word. And I think with everything, we need to be like the Bereans, to study the Word, to see whether it's in the Scripture. And that's why that's so important. So I think that is the battle of the next 10 years, the inspiration of the Word of God. And who knows if the Catholic Church or, the, excuse me, the Vatican or some other organization is going to come out with some old manuscript that's going to redefine things. But we need to make sure we cling to what we know has worked for a long, long time. Uh, amen. The, the, when Jesus says, if possible, even the elect will be deceived. Speaking of that time in the tribulation period, I, I think that for the believer to understand that things are developing that way, the genuine believer, there's, there, in my yes. mind, there's a category. There's, there's yes. fakes and there's genuine and as we see that day approaching, because we can see it approaching, again, mm -hmm. it goes back to this deception. So what if next week this document is produced? It looks like it's 2,000 years old, and it seems to prove that this has some errors in it. And, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, w what's the believer to do? I don't think the church, the genuine believers right now are that well prepared for the level of deception that is going to come uh, between now and the rapture. Again, I hope the rapture's today. I would love it. Before I have to wake up tomorrow, it would be great. You know, it would, that would be what I hope for. But well, imminent, imminent doesn't mean soon. It just means at any moment. At any That's moment. That's what imminent means. Amen. It doesn't mean soon, just means at any moment. So things can get really bad. They will get really bad and really dark, um, potentially before the rapture takes place. But that doesn't mean it couldn't happen at any moment. We just have to be prepared like those five wise virgins for him to come at any moment and also prepared to be effective as we wait. Yeah, a amen. Uh, being ready in season and out of season, being, being uh, uh, focused on the Lord, which you always bring things back to the word. By the way, I advocate for uh, verse by verse, book through by book, it. going through the Bible. That's how I began with Calvary Chapels, and that's, that's the only way my mind's ever thought. In fact, apart from that, I'm not too valuable at anything, uh, too good at anything. Um, <laughs> Nobody did so, it better than Chuck Smith. Chuck Nobody was, did it better yeah. than Chuck Smith. Very simple and straightforward and just kept plugging right on through. Yes. Uh, so, Alan, again, your book, because I, I want to encourage people to pick up your book. Can you hold it up for everybody? Summoning, I, I should have got a copy here before today. There uh, it summoning, is, Summoning the Demon. Summoning the Demon. So, uh, check it out, everybody. You are going to be greatly encouraged. You're going to learn a lot uh, through this book, too. So uh, make sure that you check out that book. Get a copy of it. You're going to be blessed. Okay. Now, you have another uh, video that you did regarding the prophetic shaking coming to the world, the importance of staying rooted in the Word, which is what we've been talking about. And, you know, I look and think, okay, uh, as a pastor, we still need to do our devotions. We can't get away from mm. these things, but the church, you know, what, what's always bothered me in the years of being a, a, a pastor, as a pastor serving in the church week in and week out for uh, over 25 years, and we look at two different churches, and then we look at this and go, okay, how many people in the church are in, their, are in the Bible apart from Sundays? You find out it's, it's not very many. How 
strong can you really be and the importance of getting back into the work. I, I, the word, I think it was a Barna poll that came out about two years ago that said something like 6% or 3% of the people who claim to be born again Christians going to church are actually in, in the Bible, read the Bible wow. every day or every week or something like that. It was a really yeah. low number. It's, it's, it's scary because that's what's going to be needed to, for us to ferret out what's true and what's false, a strong foundation of the word. For the word of God is, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of joints and marrow and of soul and of spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And as we enter into these, these dark days, that word should be a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. So we we as ministers need to fall in love once again with the word, and I think that'll be contagious. If we'll fall in love once again with the word, because failure in the in the pew only comes from failure in the pulpit. If we'll fall in love with the word once again, I think they will as well. But you're right. I think there's a lot of wheat mixed with tares. A lot of church services are really acting classes, teaching wheat how to act like tares. So they they use all the same language. They, they lift their hands, but their soul is unregenerated. And we need more of that Holy Ghost gospel preaching from the Word to see men and women born again. Amen. Amen. And ultimately, even what we do, right, it is about the gospel. It's the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I I just want to also encourage you and thank you for leading the way in ministry in missions, too. And the the importance of reaching out, because there's so little of that. We're reaching into Mexico and uh, I'm really excited about some of the things. I'll tell you about that off the record. But um, uh, we're moving forward. And I look at this in, you know, too often within, I guess, a ministry like this, prophecy ministry, it just becomes about just talking about yes. Jesus coming. That, that's, Jesus is coming again. But guess what? He wants to save souls. His desire is that none should perish. And so much of the world is forgotten, um, even by American Christians. You know, on the one hand, you have where churches are involved just to check off a box, right? Okay, we Mm -hmm. did this, we did this, we did that. But no, again, when we understand the prophetic implications of the second coming of Christ, that ought to motivate us to say, what more can I do? The time is, as far as we can tell, it's short, however short that is, however we want to define that term. Therefore, let's be about our Father's business. And I really appreciate your drive in in really leading in such a way as that just setting a, a a great example well thank you for that we we want a soul to be attached to everything we're doing or Amen. else what are we what are we doing why, why are we that doing it if, if people aren't going to be born again and saved so when you see me teaching on the end times and preaching on it from the pulpit there's always an altar call attached to it and i'm always equipping believers i believe eschatology is the greatest apologetic to win souls that exist out there so if we can teach believers Bible prophecy, it should be for the purpose of not simply to accumulate uh, all this knowledge or to scratch our, our itch concerning our fascination with the end times, but it should be to give you the ammo you need in order to share with your loved ones, the Bible is true. Jesus is coming, Amen. and here's proof of it. Amen. All of the fulfilled prophecies in the Bible prove that the Bible is true. And as we see everything converging, it's just more evidence that you need to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He came; He's coming again, but he came the first time that we would be forgiven. Amen. Yes. I, I love it. All right. Now you have uh, uh, this, the Church of Philadelphia serves as a model for surviving the shaking by being the true word of God and staying faithful to Jesus. Surviving the shaking, the Church of Philadelphia providing them I. I love looking at the seven churches, mm-hmm. and and I understand the position by some of my friends and colleagues, probably some of yours too, and that you can take all seven churches and say, okay, this fit this era, this fit that era, that fit that era, but I tend to look at it, which may be true, you know, I have some really close friends, they teach that, but all seven of the characteristics are alive and well right now, yes. or or dead right now, and they, they are everywhere in America, they're everywhere throughout the world, and, and I like looking at them because even the characteristics of the individual Christian can be found within the seven churches. And when you pull yes. out the faithful church, Church of Philadelphia, again, as a model for surviving the shaking, I love that. Can you want to uh, fl- uh, work that out a little bit? 
Yeah, actually, I'm about to head to Turkey, as a matter of fact, and I'm going to be visiting all the locations of oh, the seven churches. Okay. And, and I'm so excited about that and going to be doing a series about that here in the future. But when you look at Revelation chapter two and three, I think those are two of the most important chapters in the Bible for this generation right now. And so often people lump that in with the remainder of Revelation that they assume speaks only to future events and has little relevance for us today, which we know is not true as well. But here we have seven letters written by Jesus himself, dictated by Jesus to these seven churches. And you're right, potentially they could have referenced seven epochs of time or you know periods within church history, but we know this. They represent the seven kinds of churches, the seven kinds of believers, I think, that exist within every single church. And uh, we we can find ourselves in there and, and know how to benefit thereby, which is why the Church of Philadelphia is so key and so important, because he promised them that he was going to rescue them because of their faithfulness out of the tribulation that was coming on the earth. That's why we need to look to them for our example, this, this amazing church in Philadelphia. Yeah. No, that's so cool that you're going there. I can't wait to see your series that you're going to do on that. I've wanted to go there, do all seven churches, do a video series. Yes. Uh, someday, someday, Lord willing. Let's if, go together. Uh, uh, you know what? I would, <laughs> I'm all in. So here in the seven churches, you have the loveless church, the persecuted church, compromising church, the corrupt church, the dead church, Philadelphia, the faithful church, and then, of course, Laodicea, the lukewarm church. But again, we can find all of them. Now, I was asked a question uh, on a live stream recently about uh, Philadelphia Church and and uh, the persecution that was coming to them. And at the at the conclusion, well, not at the conclusion where Jesus says, "Behold, uh, I will keep you from the hour of tribulation that comes on the whole earth." Obviously, it's written to the church of that time, but also to the church and to the Christian throughout the ages. But it launches you into the tribulation of the last days because it's on the whole earth. It wasn't mm. just a portion of it or something like that. And we know that the Church of Philadelphia at that time would have faced persecution from the Roman Empire. Um, but it, it, it does launch us into the future. Now, with that being said, when you, we look at all seven of the churches, you also have this compromising with the Roman government. There's a lot of pressure from the Roman government to hey, uh, submit to Caesar. If you submit to Caesar, everything's going to go well for you. Hence, you find the lukewarm church, the compromising church, the dead church. You even, as you examine them, you find out, hey, there are some pretty big churches. However, Smyrna and Philadelphia were the, one, were the two that were really singled out that weren't going along with the Romans, and mm -hmm. they didn't experience great blessing from the government. But this just speaks again to the two that, that, that the Lord blesses as being doing as well. Hey, they, were, they, they were following him. They didn't have Caesar before them. And there's a whole lot of pressure right now, and it looks like a lot of churches are partnering with the government in one form or another, whether it be through woke, wokeism or yes. the, the, you know, uh, on down the list of green things and, and whatever, but we must keep Christ first, and that's really the admonition that I, that I look at there. Yeah, we're supposed to gospelize the world, but instead we've allowed them to politicize us. And we've allowed them to put us in one camp or the other. Team sports are very, it's a very lucrative thing for the enemy. He loves pitting us in camps one against the other. When we're not supposed to be an elephant or a donkey, we're, we're with the lion and the lamb. And this is greater than the R or the D. This is greater than all of that. And certainly there are, there are signs we can take and we have to be a voice of righteousness, but we cannot allow ourselves to be inundated with the politicization. We must be a prophetic voice, not a politicized voice in the sense that we're speaking the word of God to this generation and not allowing ourselves to be, because the Antichrist spirit is a political spirit. And it will turn you in, if you're not careful as a believer, it will turn you into a caricature of what a Christian ought to look like. And we need to be very cautious of that moving into this election. We need to make sure that we stand for righteousness, but we also need to make sure that we're not being political in the sense that we can't say anything bad about our guy or our individual because we want to make sure they win. No, no, no. We got to call balls and strikes. We got to say what's right and what's wrong, whether it's to the left and to the right. And they both need a heaping double dose of the gospel. Excellent, and a heaping double dose of the gospel. <laughs> That's the cherry on top. That's great. Well, your thoughts on Israel? You know, you mentioned this earlier. We've seen the hatred for Israel all of our lives. 
But over the last few years, I would say even over the last year, something odd is happening. That it's not simply outside of the church, even within the church, this anti-Semitism is creeping up. And we need to be very watchful of this. And we've got to begin sharing with our friends. We've got to begin preaching along these lines that Israel is the apple of God's eye. This does not mean that we agree with everything that an ungodly government does, whether it's in Israel or anywhere else. But it does mean that we stand for the right to exist and we support their ability to defend themselves. That doesn't mean that we give them a blank check for everything else, but we need to be watching for this anti-Semitism and recognize that Israel is the, as some have called it, mega sign of the last days. It is the proof that God is real, that he is alive, and he's still moving in the earth today. We need to be watching it very, very closely. And I think this is a sign, because I'm always thinking of, okay, where in the word does this take me to? And two, what mission is it attaching itself to? I think we need to begin ministering to the Jewish community like never before. We need to start making plans for more trips to Israel. Uh, we need to start preaching and teaching to our Jewish brothers and sisters and supporting organizations that are doing it because I think it's desperately needed right now to get the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ to the Jewish community. Amen. In fact, that's been a thought that's been in my mind over and over lately is the need to get the gospel to the Jewish people. And I'm watching certain things. When I was in Israel uh, just a couple weeks ago, it was, it was both Muslims and Jews. There was an openness to hearing about Jesus that I've never witnessed before. Wow. Um, we were in Hostage Square back in January, uh, met with a dad whose uh, son has been taken hostage. He was at the Nova concert uh, with some of his friends. His five friends were all killed. He was taken hostage. And we were in a room, get this, Alan, we were in a room full of um, Orthodox mm. Jews. And it was a group of pastors, right? Wow. They were willing to have us, we asked, can we pray for you? Yes. And not only did the dad say yes, but so did the Orthodox Jews in the room. Please pray. And you realize we're going to pray in Jesus' name. Absolutely. I mean, to have that, and we've wow. seen this, yeah, we've seen this over and over. We were with... Um, it, when I was just there a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, drive, you know, you're doing different things, filming here and there and meeting the groups and so forth. Uh, we had seven different taxi drivers while we were there. Five were Muslim, two were Jews, and all of them were willing to hear something. What, I mean, a couple of guys wanted to shut me down, but you know, we, we concluded well, right? But overall, there's an openness. I've never seen it before because they, they, the, the, the pressure against Israel is so great that I believe God is leading Israel to a place of being willing to look to him. And we know that ultimately, as we look at the Bible, that is exactly what the tribulation does. It leads Israel to a place of calling out for him, Hosanna, as Jesus said in Matthew 23, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is where Israel is being led along. They're going through great pressure and to be a part of that and say, you know, Lord, I want to be a part of your work. And maybe I won't see an individual Jew saved, although I've already seen some. But, but, but overall, with the general population of believers, maybe you won't see an individual Jew saved. But guess what? You're part of the harvest, you're part yes. of the watering, you're part of the, the planting the seed, and our reward is in heaven, uh, and Jesus is going to save Jews, and I want to be on that team, and I know he's saving Muslims at the same time. I want to be on that team sharing this hope uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and here's something else. I, I just I really like your thoughts on this, but this drives me nuts. Major anti-Semitism, yet we know God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, oh. and Jacob, um, and then we look at Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, chapter 36, excuse me, where the Lord says, I will bring you back home, back into the land. Yes. Uh, even though you profane my name everywhere you went, I will do it because my name is on the covenant. And, and you have people who, who are anti-Semitic in churches. They're saying, look what they've done to the name of God. They've done this and they've done that. They're Christ killers. They're this, they're that. And we're hearing it increase in churches. Yet I believe it is being used as a witness against the believer who says, grace is good for me, but the Jews can't have it. Mercy is good for me, but they can't have it because they profane his name. Did you not profane his name? Come on. Did you yes. not do the perverted thing before you got saved or maybe even after you say you're saved? 
What have you done to deserve grace? You've done absolutely nothing, and yet you have a different requirement for the nation of Israel than the Jew. That makes no sense. And I believe this, what's going on with Israel right now is going to be used as a testimony, a witness against those who claim to know Christ who are coming out in their anti-Semitic uh, opinions. Yeah, in Ezekiel 36, it's almost as if God is getting a show. He's like gathering a crowd of doubters, and he's causing something to happen to get people to gather more and more. And then he says, I'm going to be sanctified in you yeah. before their very Amen. eyes, and then they will know that I am the Lord God Almighty. And, and it's it's interesting that that you had that experience because that that is really unusual. For people who haven't been to Israel, you've never encountered a religious spirit or atmosphere until you've been to Israel. And it's almost as if there's these constant invisible barriers everywhere you go the moment the name of Jesus is mentioned. And it seems like those are breaking up. And because of the pressure, people are coming together, not just there. I, I believe that we're seeing the streams of the camps of the body of Christ coming together in a way we haven't before. And I think a lot of it is happening over a fascination with Israel and a fashion is with the end times, and many of them don't even understand why. I heard one minister say that he, they were a replacement minister, and they went to Israel, and they were going to talk about how now, you know, we have replaced Israel, and we're the church. But standing there, he could just sense, and he knew that this was special, and it completely revolutionized his life. It seems like that that people from, and we have to be open to this, ladies and gentlemen, people from different denominations, different, different streams coming together, as long as we agree on the essentials, so that we can stand in faith together for this great end time harvest. Oh, a amen, a amen. I just love how you how you shared that. Uh, do you have any? I know I, I went to Israel. I know you know a lot of people still have reservations. Uh, Alan, we were the literally the only tour group in Caesarea. We were Whoa. the only tour, tour group in Capernaum. We were the only tour group. Uh, virtually the Mount Olives. You know what the Mount Olives is like. When you go yes. up there, it's like a million people up there. It's like Disneyland. You're like, oh, hey. And we were the only <laughs> tour group on the on the Mount Olives. Wow. Uh, in the hotels, uh, there's um, you have the evacuees. They're staying in the hotels with you. My, my wife uh, had met in one of the hotels in Tel Aviv in the lobby, um, just started talking. There's a, a lady that was there with her mom and dad. Her husband was one of the soldiers that was killed. And you know, they're just heartbroken, but they're, they're, there's an openness and the evacuees were so thankful that we came. Yes. You know, I mean, th this has been going on for months and to see this, I mean, we are, uh, th something is happening. God has the world's attention on Israel. And, um, and to be a part of, I, I will be a part, I know you will too, be a part of the sharing of the truth of Jesus with the Jews. And not just because I'm biased or something like that, but I know the biblical teachings. And I will yes. share them with Muslims too, so I'm not just singling them out. But understanding the dynamic of the time that we are in, these are absolutely amazing, uh, amazing days to be alive. And Well, thank and, you um, for doing that, by the way. Thank you for going, because the greatest thing you can do to support Israel is to go there. Yeah. It's the greatest thing you could do because it's a tourist society. So they've been devastated economically as a result of what's happened recently. And for you to go and and just be there, it's ministering to them. And that is a seed sown in good ground. And I encourage everybody to do the same and to support this ministry and what they're doing in the Holy Land. Absolutely. In fact, um, and I'll get on with another question here in a second, but uh, we are at the Jaffa Gate and yeah. we had to get a taxi, uh, a taxi ride. I was going to film with his channel and need the taxi ride, and we get with the driver. He's a Muslim driver, and uh, he said we were his first customer since October 7th. What? That is, I mean, how do they even live? And when you're in the old city. You know all the shops in the old city? Yes. I was encouraging people, hey, these people have had zero income. Go buy, buy, buy some of the things that they're selling. This is all the, mm -hmm. this is, this is how they live. And, yeah. and, uh, and you'll still have something to take home, give to friends or something like that, but it's supporting them. And again, these are Muslims and Jews, so we're not just singling people out, but understanding the dynamic. And ultimately, this comes down to the hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, All right. What? Okay, here, here's a question. I'll get through this as quick as I can from here. I've, been on, I've held you over for quite some time. I'm loving this. How, Come on. How has, the lung, how has the younger generation's awareness of evil in the world led to broader spiritual awakening? 
Yeah, I think this generation is obviously looking for spiritual things, and they're looking for truth. This is why a friend of mine refers to Jordan Peterson and all these other speakers as stolen thunder, where you have these conservative voices that aren't preaching the gospel. Many of them aren't even saved. And we have the young people rushing into these conference halls, and you'll notice there's no music. There's no smoke machine. There's no light machine. They're not dumbing it down for them. If you've ever listened to Jordan Peterson, they're just hungry for somebody to tell them the truth. Well, we don't need to let them do that. We need as let them do certainly keep doing what they're doing, but we need to be the ones who are bringing the truth of the gospel. Yeah. So not only hungry for truth, they're hungry for spiritual things, and they're searching for it in paganism. They're searching for it in age. They're searching for it in Satanism in a variety of different ways. We have the answer. And so they're hungry for spiritual things. All we have to do is show them that what we have is alive and well in the earth today. Let the Spirit of God move through us. Uh, don't you think what's happened within the church overall, I mean, I'm not talking yet about in the last four years. I can go back 20 years, 30 years. Uh, it is this drive to, we just need to attract people. You said mm -hmm. it earlier, we've become more like something to the effect, instead of us evangelizing the world, the world has evangelized the church. I'm not sure if those are your exact words, but yeah. basically that's it. And so uh, this has been going on for a long time. You don't want to bring too much of you don't want to bring too much of this to because this is going to be offensive. Uh, you you don't want to talk about sin or, or it's just making people feel comfortable, but people want answers. And so mm. what they found is they aren't getting the answer in the church, but God still has His people. He will bring to your church. He will bring yes. to listen to the truth that you are telling, and that's really what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah, acceptance is an intoxicant. And the church is in need of an intervention because we have become drunken on their acceptance. We want them to like us. And of course, the justification is that if they'll, if they'll like us, if they realize that we're not too, so crazy and we're not too weird, maybe they'll come in and they'll hear the gospel and then they'll get saved. But the problem is they come in and they hear and we're so excited that they came in. Now we're altering our message in order to keep them there. Because whatever you did to get them, you're going to have to do that in order to keep them. And now again, we have this church full of tares acting like weed. And I think we have a generation that is desperately hungry for radical, bold truths to be spoken. And even if they don't fully agree, they will gravitate toward it. And in addition to that, we have a promise that if he is lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. So we're not the ones who are supposed to be yeah. doing this job. This is the Holy Spirit's job. I think we've attempted to take yeah. the Spirit of God's job by wooing people. We're just supposed to be fools for Christ, right? He has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. We're just supposed to preach a message that to many seems foolish, but the Holy Spirit does the drawing. So let's let him do his job, and let's do our job. Amen. That was so well said. Uh, what are the greatest prophetic signs uh, we are witnessing that point to the soon return of Christ? Now, granted, soon is a word like what exactly does it mean in our culture? Yeah. You know, though, but sometimes using that word can, uh, can, uh, can get people to think tomorrow. But again, it's a, let's think of imminence. But what are, I mean, if I were to look at it, I would say the nation of Israel, advancement of, of, of uh, AI technology. Um, your thoughts? Well, Israel, of course, is the mega sign. 1948, Israel becomes a nation. Interestingly enough, that very same year, there's an earthquake in the mountains of Ararat, and Noah's Ark is supposedly uncovered in the mountains of Ararat the very same year. Research has been done from that time until this. In 2023, they've been doing radar, all kinds of research. They are confirming that it is, in fact, it appears to be the actual location of Noah's Ark. I don't know where everybody lands on that, but it doesn't matter because what's happening right now is everyone is talking about Noah and Noah's Ark. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, yeah. so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In addition to that, we have technologies, the likes of which have never existed in all of human history. The red heifers made their way from Texas all the way over to Israel. There are four left, if I understand. They are in that group. There's 16 more in Texas and more. Uh, I think uh, Mondo has done an amazing job uh, talking about that on Prophecy Watchers. Uh, we see all of this happening in front of us. Prophecy is being fulfilled to the letter, which is telling us, get ready, get ready, get ready. And so I think if we'll get that in our spirits and then take that to the workplace, 
everyone is interested in this. I write about aliens and, and the Antichrist agenda and technology and AI because everybody is interested in talking about this. For too long, the world has been lying well, and we've been telling the truth badly. We have an amazing story to tell. All we have to do is get involved in the conversation. So that's what I'm encouraging everybody to do. Yeah. All, all you have to do when you meet somebody is just say, doesn't it seem like something weird is going on? And you know, pretty yes. much pretty much everybody yeah. would go, yeah, and then, then that, that'll launch into everything. But it's not a coincidence that all of these things happen to be coming about all at the same time. It, it is amazing. I've thought for years, I remember teaching through the book of Revelation, it was probably 15 years ago. And uh, I was talking about the Euphrates River, it's gonna dry up during the tribulation, and this is gonna happen, that's gonna happen. And I said, I personally believe that Noah's Ark is going to be exposed at yes. the, somewhere at that time as it, it just held up based on not just as it was in the days of Noah. And also Peter even writes about the days of Noah and the flood mm. and so forth. But just the way that this was a judgment in the past is judgment coming and God is proving his word true. One of the remarkable things, again, you get to go to Turkey, which is really cool, uh, going to Israel, as you well know, there's more and more archaeology that is uh, things that are being discovered through archaeology every there. Day. Every day. Yeah, every single time. If you went there three weeks ago, you can go back next week and you'll find out more things. All these things are proving the, the truth of the Bible, the, that Jesus really was here, that he was who he said he was. And it's in Psalm 102. I, this just is so cool where it talks about Israel during, really during the millennial kingdom, but they will delight in her dirt. And I love mm. that and, and rejoice in her rocks. And you look, you go, this is, I mean, when you look at archeology, span you go, this is, this is what's happening even right now. Granted, a glimpse of what's coming, but we are seeing all these different things. And, and I love how you, you, you put all these different things together. It's not a coincidence. These things no, are happening. Every, every single day. Uh, the Bible says that Jerusalem will shake the dust off of herself. And you've been to the city of David. Every day you'll see that prophecy being fulfilled as they're removing the dust. The dust is being shaken off and they're uncovering these biblical artifacts that that prove not only Israel's history there and its right to exist, but that everything the Bible said is true. It is literally shaking the dust off of itself. The desert is blossoming like a rose. We are, we are just seeing, it's just amazing. A hundred years ago, who would have imagined? Yeah that we would be seeing all of these things, including the technology that we see with AI that allows the Antichrist agenda to be advanced. It's just a thrilling time to be alive. And again, we've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Amen, a thrilling time to be alive. Let me ask you this, how do you stay encouraged during these times? I, mean, I can guess just based on things you've shared and your joy, but as we watch things accelerating, um, how do you stay encouraged and what would be your recommendation for people? Because People still, they just get so, they, they have the opposite. It, it just, it doesn't uh, have the same results with a lot of people. They start looking at these things, they get so worried and fearful. That should not be the case. So how do you stay encouraged and what would be your recommendation for folks? Well, my people are destroyed, the Bible says, for a lack of knowledge. Daniel then declares that there will be an explosion of knowledge. Now, there are some who say that that means that that explosion of knowledge is an advancement in technology, and I believe that's certainly relevant. Others say it's an explosion of knowledge of Bible prophecy, that men will run to and fro through the prophetic scriptures. And I believe that's true as well. And I think that in every believer's life, there needs to be an explosion of knowledge. And here's what the Bible says happens, according to the book of Romans. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So if we'll get into these studies on Bible prophecy, and I encourage everybody, if you haven't already subscribed to Hope for Our Times, you need to do it right now, because you're gonna hear this teaching, you're gonna hear the word, hear the word, hear the word, and it's gonna build end time faith on the inside of you to overcome the world in every area of your life. We can do it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, and I want to encourage you all to make sure, if you haven't done so already, go to Encounter Today for Alan's, all of Alan's videos, Bishop Alan Didio, by the way. So there. So uh, go there for <laughs> everything that he has encountered today. He has his YouTube channel. He has his website. Everything is there. His book. Make sure that you get his book. Subscribe to his channel. And again, like Alan said, you like, subscribe, share. It's free to do all of those things. 
and it really does help with the algorithms for us to be able to get the word out. And uh, people need to hear this, these things. Alan, just been great with you today. How can we pray for you? How can the Hope for Our Times group pay, pray for you? First of all, it has been such an honor. Thank you so much. And stand in faith with us with supernatural wisdom. I, like you, we're going, you know, Mach 10 with our hair on fire. And we need to make sure that every decision we make is for the glory of God, for the advancement of his kingdom, and that with every single dollar, with every single decision, souls are being won as a result of it. So supernatural wisdom would be the greatest prayer request I would have right now. Amen. Supernatural wisdom. Uh, in fact, I'm going to pray right now. Lord, we thank you for this great thank opportunity you, today. And uh, together, we lift up uh, Alan to you. We pray for your ministering to him, spirit, uh, supernatural wisdom being imparted to him, and also strength to persevere forward for he and his entire staff as we move forward together in the hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, grant him that insight is necessary as we go through this world with all of the turns, all of the different news every day, Lord, cause Alan and his, his team to be faithful, to staying in your word, to not turning to the left or the right, and to continue to be the leader that he is in ministering the truth and also ministering the missions, touching lives, uh, uh, one soul at a time, with the hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for him, his faithfulness, and his example he is for this community and myself, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, man. It was wonderful having you on today. I told you everybody you were going to be blessed again. Make sure that you check out Alan's website, his, his uh, YouTube channel, also Encounter Today. God bless you, everybody. See you tomorrow.